So, uh, thank you very much for having me. It's uh, been my first trip to Des Moines, and uh, it's been wonderful so far. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I am very honored to be here, you know, during Lincoln's bicentennial year. Uh, I've been giving a number of speeches, you know, in different places around the country uh, this year. And I always say the same thing. I think there's something that we need to remind ourselves this year that we should try to do. Uh, it's, a, it's hard with Lincoln, but it's important. Uh, and that is, uh, we should try to say new things about him. And we should try to learn new things about him. As familiar as Lincoln is in our culture, there's still more to discover. And so tonight, I'm going to try to live up to that standard. Uh, tell me if I don't. Um, I am going to try to tell you some new things about Lincoln, and one way I'm going to do that is by featuring the story of a place that's relatively new. Uh, you should have received a handout when you came in here um, that has a, a picture of a cottage that Lincoln stayed at uh, in Washington, kind of like a Camp David for his presidency. Uh, this cottage has just been opened to the public a year ago. There are a few people in this room who've been there, but I think most people have never been there. Um, and, and it is arguably the most exciting new event in the story of Abraham Lincoln in the last couple of years. It was the subject of the book I wrote. It's a major project of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And I also think it opens up a, an interesting window on Lincoln that I want to talk about tonight. And it relates to something that um, Rod brought up a few minutes ago when he sort of described the Citizens Arise project here which is namely that if we're going to talk about democracy and citizenship, we need to remember one very important thing, and that is at both ends of the spectrum, that our leaders are not just citizens, they are also people. They are human and flawed, and they have private lives, and yet they live in public. Uh, they need to remember that, <laughs> uh, and we need to remember that. And that's true for uh, living politicians, and it's true for dead ones, it's true for small ones and great ones, it's true for Abraham Lincoln. And so I titled this talk, Abraham Lincoln, Private Man, Public Leader, for that reason. I thought it fit the, the twin bill of uh, speaking about Lincoln in a new way and also talking about him in a way that helps us focus on what it means to live in a democracy where we elect fellow citizens as our leaders. They're nothing special. They're one of us, and yet they represent us in the halls of power. Lincoln is one of those figures, someone who was ordinary in so many ways. And that's what I want to talk about. Now, and when you think of the title maybe on the surface of this talk, private man, public leader, you might be thinking or worrying you know, that I'm going to develop some uh, cockamamie theory about how he had a lost love or a secret in his private life, that he was depressed or he was gay or there's something in his story that has you know, uh, ramifications that affected his public leadership. There are people who believe these things and they've written books and articles about them. That's not my subject tonight. I actually want to talk about something that's a lot more commonplace, but I think it's more important, and that is the intersection between the private and the public, uh, the, the balance between work and family, and also the need to find private space when you're in the public eye. These are things I think all of us in some ways can appreciate, and they're things that Lincoln struggled with. And if you look quickly at the handout I gave you, there's a quotation at the top of it that I actually think is one of Lincoln's more profound and rare personal comments. It's not widely known, but I find it to be very revealing about him. And in some ways, it's the theme of my talk tonight. And that is, uh, in a letter to his wife, April 16th, 1848, he wrote, in this troublesome world, we are never quite satisfied. And my theory about Lincoln's uh, private and public uh, concerns is that he was uh, or spent most of his life dissatisfied. Dissatisfied with the way he juggled these things. Dissatisfied with the privacy he was finding as a public figure. And it was only really in some ways at the soldier's home, at the Lincoln Cottage at the soldier's home that I'll describe in a few minutes, uh, that he was able to find that balance that had been eluding him for most of his life, really near the end of his life. And uh, that's the story I'm going to try to tell tonight. Now, I'll talk for 40 or 45 minutes or so, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, if you have a pressing question while I'm talking, feel free to interrupt. Uh, Lincoln would have. Uh, he loved to come to events like this. Uh, he used to whittle in the audience when he went to talks. Uh, and uh, he certainly is somebody who wouldn't have been shy about speaking up if he needed to, so don't, don't feel shy. Uh, the story I want to tell begins, though, uh, with this quotation from the letter. In this troublesome world, we are never quite satisfied. That's a kind of stunning thing to say. The background to that quotation is even more revealing. So this is a letter Abraham Lincoln wrote to his wife when he's 39 and she's 29. He's a first-term member of Congress. 
And it's the opening line of a letter he wrote to her apologizing for his behavior. It turns out that Lincoln had gotten himself elected to Congress in 1846. Back then, you might have an election in 1846, but he didn't actually take office until 1848. And he brought his family with him. This was actually kind of unusual back then. Uh, congressmen usually went to Washington alone. They left their families behind. Uh, but Lincoln brought his wife and two young boys with him, Robert and Eddie. Uh, this was an exciting kind of extraordinary moment for the family. Uh, Abraham Lincoln once said, I was raised to farm work. He came from an undistinguished family. Uh, many of you know this story, but born in Kentucky, grew up in southern Indiana, relocated to Illinois. Um, he had come from nothing, really, and in a relatively short time, by the age of 39, he's a member of Congress. And he's proud of it. And he brings his wife and his kids with him. But they're living in a boarding house. Back then, congressmen tend to live in these boarding houses together in one room, in a boarding house in Washington, uh, with other single sort of, or uh, married men acting as single men in this boarding house, and it was, a, it, was, it was chaotic. Lincoln felt oppressed by the family obligations crowding in on him as he's learning the ropes as a congressman. And so apparently he got um, disgruntled and sent the wife and, her, and the children back to her father's house in Lexington, Kentucky. And while they were away, in Lexington, this is in the spring of 48, he writes this letter. And he says, in this troublesome world, we're never quite satisfied. And he goes on to say, when you were here, you were in my way. And now that you're gone, I'm lonely. Work means nothing to me anymore. I'm bored and lonely. And now I realize how much, in effect, he says, I missed you. And then he goes on in a rare letter. You know, we don't have that many letters between Abraham Lincoln and his wife. Uh, they, you know, they don't really exist. There's a, less than a dozen. And this is one of them. And in that letter, he's, he's affectionate. Now, you know, affection in their terms is a little different than our terms. Uh, he, at one point, he asked her to weigh herself and tell him how much she weighed. Um, <laughs> he wanted her to be heavier. That's the difference, you know, in their world than ours. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, being plump in the 19th century was a sign of uh, uh, success, and uh, he was encouraging it. Uh, but it was clearly an affectionate letter, and even though... Uh, there are some signs in the letter that uh, they have concerns over money, maybe some minor differences over things. Uh, the bottom line is you can see a real underlying affection between the two, especially now that absence has made the heart grow fonder and he's reached this conclusion that he can't enjoy himself as much without the family even though he, he regretted them when they were there. So that's an opening sort of snapshot of the problem that Lincoln faced, which is you know, how to juggle work and family, how to juggle all these aspirations for success in your career with all the obligations you accrue as an individual with kids and everything. But this is a problem that he had been dealing with from the beginning of his life. So I just want to step back for a minute and give a little additional background. Again, I do think most of this part of the story is familiar to people, but just in case it isn't, it's important to remind ourselves that as Lincoln was growing up in Kentucky, especially in southern Indiana, he ran afoul of his family's ambitions. You know, his personal ambitions and his family's ambitions were, were separated. His father was uh, raising him to be a farmer, and Lincoln was aspiring to be something else. And when he would sneak away from farm work to read in order to educate himself, his father sometimes, according to some of the testimony from uh, relatives and neighbors, would beat him for that, you know, for neglecting his work. But what Lincoln thought he was doing was preparing for work. And so this is a story about someone as a child who's learning that there's a difference between what your family needs and what you want. And as soon as he was able to reach what they called then the age of emancipation, which meant the age of 21, he left the family farm and set off on his own. And really never much visited his parents after that. His mother had died when he was nine. His father had remarried. Lincoln treated his stepmother like his real mother. Um, he had an older sister who died. But he seemed to have a real distance with his father. Uh, he hardly ever visited after he left the family farm. Uh, and then when his father was dying, a stepbrother wrote Lincoln and asked him to come and visit him. And Lincoln said, and again, I do think in some ways this is something that you know, many people can understand. He says to the stepbrother, it would be more painful than anything else to try to reunite with my father now. And so he let his father die without any last visit. And then after his father died, he didn't attend the funeral and for years didn't buy a gravestone for him. Now, you know, this is kind of remarkable in that we think of Lincoln in a certain way. And, and, and yet, 
it's also very ordinary that sons and fathers have tension, and fathers who want one thing for their sons and sons who want something else sometimes grow alienated. But it is striking in Lincoln. Think about this. This is a man who venerated the founding fathers, so much so that he never called them the founding fathers. You can look high and low in Lincoln's writings. He only always called them our fathers. They were his true fathers in his mind. You know, he kind of rejected his father and embraced Washington and Jefferson and the others as his real fathers. Uh, and it's, a, it's an extraordinary little story there as a backdrop to what later happened to him when he became a father in particular. Because Abraham Lincoln, you know, after he courted Mary Todd and they began to raise a family, ultimately they'd have four boys. Uh, Robert and Eddie, the two little boys they took to Congress. Uh, then Eddie would die. Uh, as a relatively small child. Uh, and then they have two more boys in the 1850s, uh, Willie and Tad. Uh, Lincoln, uh, as much as he was affectionate and loving to his children, was also distant from them too, especially the older son, Robert. Um, and that was because he was a workaholic. Uh, again, something that many of us can appreciate, but Lincoln was a lawyer and a politician. And the two demands on his, uh, on his time that were very pressing were engagements to speak or to appear in court. And because of that, he had to travel constantly. And so even though we don't think of Lincoln as someone who's on the road all the time, in fact, he was. Uh, he was a circuit riding attorney who traveled uh, from county seat to county seat in Illinois, as attorneys did back then. But unlike most of the other attorneys in Illinois of Lincoln's era, Lincoln rode both seasons of the circuit. That meant that he never really had a time during the year when he was sort of uh, situated in the office. He had a partner who would stay in the office, and Lincoln was kind of the rainmaker of the firm. It was a two-man firm. Uh, and he would run around from county seat to county seat and spend days, even weeks at a time, away from home. And that was his life as an attorney. Then multiply that by the speaking engagements he accrued as a politician. Lincoln, it turns out, one of the reasons, at least, for his success was that whenever somebody needed a speech, he was there. If uh, a Whig, Lincoln was at first a member of the Whig Party, then later a member of the Republican Party. When the Whig Committee needed the speaker, Lincoln went. When he was a congressman in Illinois, he still was giving speeches in New England. When he was an aspiring Republican Party leader in the state of Illinois, struggling to organize the state party, he's still coming out and giving speeches in Kansas, Ohio, across the Midwest, even briefly in Iowa. Um, he is somebody who was constantly on the road. And you know we glance over this, but his son did not. Robert remembered, years later, that he rarely saw his father when he was growing up. And you know, we don't think of this, but imagine what it would be like to have Abraham Lincoln as a father, working all the time, traveling all the time, and feeling perhaps neglected. And that's why, even though I said I wasn't going to develop these sort of uh, wild theories, uh, I do, at this moment, want to do a little armchair uh, psychologizing, because uh, you know, there are rumors, there was gossip among the Lincoln neighbors, that Mary Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln used to fight that there were fights, uh, she threw temper tantrums. She was kind of notorious in the neighborhood for being difficult. Uh, the, ki the children, the neighbors complained at least, that the children were spoiled and rambunctious, that the Lincolns exercised no discipline over their children. OK, now here's my armchair little insight. Take it for what it's worth, but it's a very light touch. But the idea here is that if you have a father or a husband who travels constantly and is absorbed by his work, then one way to get his attention is to act out. This is a common thing. People see this all the time. But the kids and the wife, perhaps, both would sometimes act out in, in fits or tantrums or spoiled behavior in order to force Lincoln to pay attention to them. Now, again, I say this uh, not to denigrate Lincoln as a father or a husband. Uh, there are all kinds of signs that he was affectionate and loving. But I do think it's fair, it's important to recognize that it was hard for him to be a good father and a good husband at the same time that he was becoming a very successful attorney and a very important political figure in Illinois. It's almost impossible to do both well, to do both the public obligations of a career like his and the private obligations of a family like his and do it well. It's, it would strain anybody, and it certainly strained him. And you can see that in the patterns of the family life, the, 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 the actions of the children, the reports of the fights, the, the, the slight fragments of remarks that you might see from the family members.
the alienation that seems to develop a little bit between Mary Lincoln and her husband over the 1850s. And this alienation is kind of important because one reason they found, uh, I think, what was a real love between each other was because they were both very political. Uh, the biographers of Mary Lincoln have noted repeatedly that uh, they seem to have fallen in love during a presidential campaign of 1840. They were both supporters of the Whig candidate uh, for president that year. It was one of the first modern campaigns, the hard, ca the, uh, hard cider and log cabin campaign of William Henry Harrison. And they were both uh, eager to support their party, and they seem to have fallen in love that year. They got married two years later in 1842. And uh, Mary Lincoln's you know, political connections from Kentucky, her interest in politics, her intelligence, her education, uh, it made her very attractive to her husband. She was a political partner as much as a soulmate. But because Lincoln was so devoted to politics, that made her a kind of soulmate. And they spend an awful lot of time talking and doing politics. That's one reason why she comes with him to Washington. But over the years, her political views kind of ossify or harden, and his become more flexible. Uh, he adapts to changing times. And the biggest change of all, as, as, as many of you know, is the growing polarization of the country over slavery. And Lincoln is moving away from that old Whig view that they had once shared toward this new Republican Party. And she was slower to adapt to that, slower to adapt to changing times like the rising tide of immigrants who are coming in, which bothered her enormously. Bothered him a little bit, but he was always willing to work with immigrants if they were willing to work with him. She was a little less forgiving. And so he began to leave her behind and keep her out of some of the political discussions because perhaps she was too opinionated or she created problems for him. Uh, with some of his new allies. And then we reach this enormous and important moment where both of their ambitions would seem to be fulfilled in his sudden vault into national prominence at the end of the 1850s and his election as president in 1860. It's this extraordinary tale. And something remarkable happens then. And this is where I begin to try to develop the uh, story about the impact of his experience at the cottage and the soldier's home. But before I get there, I want to bring up something that gets overlooked in almost every account of their presidency. Lincoln wins the White House. The family travels to Washington. When they locate there, it, this should be the solution to all of their problems. Think about this for a second. For the first time in Abraham Lincoln's life, his office is in the house. So he's at home every day. And especially once the war opens up and, and becomes you know, this crisis of unmagnified proportions, then he needs to be in the office all the time. And he is a workaholic. And so he gets to the office early and stays late. Uh, but it's in the house. And so he's always with them. And now here's where things get really interesting. And I can't uh, even begin to try to explain this. There's no direct evidence from any of the immediate participants. But as soon as Lincoln gets locked into what he'll call the iron cage of the White House, Mary Lincoln starts to travel. <laughs> it, it's almost too rich. It's as if you know, you're, you're writing this as a script. But she suddenly begins to find the urge to go shopping in New York, to visit her son Robert, who also is away now at Harvard, and to travel across the North. She takes a summer vacation in 1861 in New Jersey because her husband you know, uh, wasn't able to. And therefore, she wasn't going to be left behind and uh, wasn't going to be locked down at the White House with him, even though the war had uh, erupted, she knew the family needed some time uh, with rest and relaxation. As a middle class uh, 19th century family, they needed time to themselves. Lincoln didn't quite appreciate that, but she wasn't going to be bothered by it. She took the boys, traveled, went away, and Abraham Lincoln's left behind. When he's there at their mercy, they leave him. When he was away, they regretted it. And it's kind of this remarkable thing. Um, there is this um, interesting um, change, though, that happens. Actually, it's not interesting is the wrong word. It's, it's poignant. Uh, so that's the first year, 1861. Then in the spring of 1862, this sad thing happens, which is that the Lincoln's uh, second oldest boy, Willie, dies from disease in February. And the family enters into a period of mourning. While the family is in mourning, uh, Mary Lincoln finds it completely disturbing and unnerving that uh, the business of the White House continues. 
you know, she had, I think, realized that she couldn't close the White House to visitors, as you might expect, uh, or to business during a year of grief, as, as a family might normally conduct after the loss of a child. But uh, she was still stunned when White House aides came to her in the spring and they said, we want to start the Marine Band concert series on the lawn. She said, this is no time for a concert series. Uh, and they said, OK, well, how about if we move the concert series across the road to Lafayette Square? Uh, she was outraged by that. And then at this point, she goes to her husband, and I don't have any direct evidence, uh, any document for this, but I, I think what's clear is that she goes to her husband, and she says to him, they need to find some space for themselves. And shortly after that, they begin a process of spending each summer at this cottage that you're looking at in the handout on the grounds of what was a retired military veterans community called the Soldier's Home. Uh, it's about three and a half miles from the White House. It had first been built in the early 1850s. It was uh, about 200 acres, a kind of compound with different cottages and buildings. And, and James Buchanan was the first president to, to use the, the Soldier's Home compound and the cottages on the grounds as a kind of summer retreat. The reason why it's so attractive as a kind of 19th century Camp David, in this era before air conditioning, uh, it was on uh, elevated ground. It was the second highest elevation in the district. It was shaded by lots of trees. There was breezes. It was cooler. The grounds around the Potomac then were polluted. Uh, the water, the air, the mosquitoes, the heat, the visitors, the stench. And so the White House in the summer is particularly unattractive. The soldier's home was this bucolic retreat just a few miles away. Buchanan loved it. It's probably the only good thing he ever did for Abraham Lincoln because uh, they met on inauguration day and he must have told Lincoln about this. Again, I say must have because there's no direct testimony that he did, but literally two days after the inauguration, Abraham Lincoln rode out to the soldier's home to take a look and a day later his wife did as well. And so clearly he was doing this on the recommendation of the past occupant of the soldier's home. And I'll tell you something else interesting. Um, we don't really hear about the soldiers' home. We haven't until the last couple of years when the National Trust restored this. But it used to be a very well-known location. And I could document this today with a piece of evidence I just turned up in the um, uh, state archives. When I went down this afternoon in the Grenville Dodge papers, he visited the soldiers' home uh, in 1861 in March and wrote about it to his wife. Uh, and there's a letter in his papers. I wanted to read to you a little bit of it because it definitely captures the impression the soldiers' home left on people, Iowans and others, uh, in the era when Lincoln lived there. He writes to his wife, Annie, on March 17, 1861. This is right after the inaugural, just a week after Lincoln had visited. I have visited the soldiers' home, of which you have often heard. It is four miles out of the city, located on an elevated piece of ground with fine stone cottages and a large citadel capable of containing hundreds of old soldiers. On the front of the portico stands out in bold relief a grateful country to her defenders. Old soldiers who are maimed or invalided in their country's cause and worn out with age in her service find here a place of resort with beautiful views and charming surroundings, visible to the eye in all directions, fine clean walks shaded with trees of all climes, and bordered with plants from the Rocky Mountains to the savannas of the south. The cottage that Buchanan spent the summer months in stands there now, vacant, but it looks inviting with its clean, uh, cut and beautiful symmetry, its white granite front and dormer windows, the whole just large enough for a small family. I was taken with the place. <laughs> I think you'll appreciate this comment. It is the only inviting spot or thing I have seen here since I've been here. <laughs> He's from Iowa. He's not impressed by Washington. Uh, Mrs. Lincoln will take up her abode there in the hot weather. Now, that was in the spring of 1861. Buchanan actually did not stay at the cottage that you're looking at here. Uh, there were about four or five cottages on the grounds. Uh, his cottage was nearby, just across the way from this one. Uh, and that was where the Lincolns were supposed to stay in the summer of 61. But that was the moment when Abraham Lincoln refused to vacate the White House. And so Mary Lincoln went to New Jersey. It was only after the death of son Willie that I think Lincoln came around to the idea that he needed some time away from the iron cage at the White House. And so they began to spend summers at this cottage. Uh, a total 
of a quarter of his presidency was spent in residence at this soldier's home, uh, 13 months. And that was only when they were in residence. Uh, most of the rest of the year, Lincoln would take an afternoon carriage ride out and back to the soldier's home. Uh, he did that, as I said, the first week of his uh, time in the White House. He did it on the day before he was killed at Ford's Theater. It brackets his whole experience in the presidency. Uh, and I think it changed him. Uh, and I'll begin to give you a few examples of that. We can talk about more. If you're interested in this subject, you know, obviously there's more details in my book, or I really would urge you next time you're in Washington to visit the place. Um, but here's one story that I think really captures the value of a place like this for Lincoln in helping him navigate you know, his private life and his concerns with his public obligations. So they move out to the soldier's home in June of 1862. Uh, at the, two, months, uh, two, two weeks after that, the end of the month of June, there's a problem. Uh, some of you may remember the, the war after a year has gone uh, with mixed results for the Union. There's progress in the western theater of the war in the Mississippi Valley, but there's stalemate on the eastern theater of the war. Union troops have tried a flanking maneuver. They've landed on the peninsula of Virginia and they're fighting their way up from the south toward Richmond. Uh, General George McClellan is leading this operation, but it's stalled. Uh, there is concern just prior to what they're going to call the Seven Days Battle that uh, he needs more men. And so Abraham Lincoln and his cabinet decide that they've got to reach out to the war governors of the North and convince them uh, to uh, send more troops. But this is classic. Uh, in an almost stereotypical Washington story, Lincoln and his cabinet members want the governors to call on them uh, to uh, ask for more troops. But the governors don't want the responsibility of being out front of the call for more men. So they want the president to tell them to send more men. Both sides are willing to do it. Neither side wants to have the political responsibility for being the person in front of it. And so they decide to do what's kind of like a 19th century conference call. Uh, they um, you know, the telegraph was invented in the late 1840s. It has now become the primary means of communication. And so they decide to gather in different telegraph offices across the north. There's a few in Boston, a few in New York, uh, a few governors scattered across the northwest. And uh, Secretary of State William Seward has gone up to New York to meet with the, the, the bulk of them who are at the New York Telegraph Office. And Lincoln and the Secretary of War, a man named Edwin Stanton, are in the War Department Telegraph Office in Washington. And they're all wiring each other back and forth during the course of this day, June 29th, 1862, talking about how they're going to navigate this call for more troops. And they're talking about 50,000 more men um, and uh, maybe up to 100,000 more men. They're debating the number. They're debating how it's going to be done. It takes them all day. Obviously, these conference calls with the telegraph wires are moving kind of slow. They're bulky. And at one point, there's a wire that comes across at the War Department um, that Stanton responds to by saying that the president was no longer there. He says, the president has gone to the country very tired. By saying he's gone to the country, he meant he's gone to the soldier's home retreat. Uh, it was about 7 o'clock at night. Now, um, there are books about the Civil War that talk about this. There are biographies of Abraham Lincoln that discuss this moment. But they never pick up what happens at the other end because it's fascinating. And we can do this because when Lincoln got to the country, very tired, at this cottage that you're looking at here, there were people waiting for him. And one of them was an old friend of his who was now the senator from Illinois, a man named Orville Browning. And Browning kept a diary. And that night, he wrote a diary entry describing what happened when Lincoln arrived at the cottage. Uh, and it's fascinating, because he was with a group of people, uh, in particular one man who wanted a job. These people were always seeking out Lincoln to get jobs. It was all about patronage. And um, they didn't care whether it was his summer retreat or not. They were after this uh, position. And so when Lincoln shows up at his cottage, and they're in his parlor, he's uh, a little miffed and uh, tells Browning to come outside with him. He's not yet ready to face yet more requests on his time or, or, or his, his position. And according to Browning's diary, they go out and they sit on the porch of this cottage. You're kind of looking at it right there. And um, he says that Lincoln didn't want to talk business. He just wanted to unwind. And so he unwound by reading a volume of poetry uh, by a minor poet you may not have heard of named Fitz Green Halleck. 
Uh, he was a poet of some note back then, but he's not well known anymore. But you can get his poetry online. And uh, there was one poem that Lincoln was reading from called Fanny. Uh, and there are a couple of lines in the poem that would have provoked some real emotion, I think, from Abraham Lincoln, who had just lost a son, uh, and now was contemplating sending other people's sons into battle. Uh, and uh, the lines read like this. Childhood's frolic hours are brief, and oft in after years, their memory comes to chill the heart and dim the eye with tears. Now, it's not Shakespeare, but it's moving when you've just lost a son, when you're contemplating this. And according to Browning, you know, Lincoln is, is reciting this to him, reading it to him, and uh, he's emotional. And Browning's very disapproving of this. He finds this all unbecoming. Uh, um, but you can see, I think, something more human and very becoming from our perspective. Here's a president who's just trying to unleash the burdens of his life in his office. And what happens next is, according to Browning, Lincoln finally composed himself. They start to look at maps showing the progress of the troops on the peninsula. Lincoln talks about the, the problems he's facing at the telegraph office. And that's the end of the story as far as Browning's diary is concerned. The next day, though, and this is where I find great meaning, Lincoln shows up at the office. And he's decided he's no longer going to haggle with the governors over who calls for the troops. He's going to do it. And he's not going to call for 50,000 men. And he's not going to call for 150,000 men. He's going to call for 300,000 men. Because his attitude is that if he's going to make a bold gamble, he's going to make a bold gamble. And he wants to send a message that there are no stakes too high for victory. And so you can see where I'm going with this. I feel as if without that little moment of peace and reflection, a little bit of recluse, just a, a touch of sanctuary, he might not have found the strength, the will, to make the tough and risky decision, which turned out to be the right one, even though it did not end the war at all. But time and again, eh, during his experience at this place, the, the soldier's home, Lincoln would find the equilibrium, the sanctuary that gave him the strength to make bold public decisions. Um, there are many other ways to show this. But there is one more story I wanted to tell that really spells out, I think, how Abraham Lincoln and his wife uh, experienced life in the soldier's home in a way that changed their relationship and also helped make him a better leader. Uh, and that comes from the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, we all know about the Battle of Gettysburg, the three days in early July. But what you may not remember or know is that on the second day of the battle, Mary Lincoln was leaving the cottage to go visit some wounded soldiers at a nearby hospital. And there was an accident with her carriage. And she fell. And she hit her head. And it was cut. And then the wound became infected. Back then, disease was a great killer. T soldiers were twice as likely to die from disease as they were from combat. Uh, Mary Lincoln, during the days after this accident, according to her nurse, was on her deathbed. Now, as, as you remember, I think, uh, the Union won this great victory at Gettysburg, but Abraham Lincoln was kind of distraught after the victory because he thought that it was a huge missed opportunity. Uh, Lee's army was still at loose, even though the Union troops had won, and he wanted the Union army to chase after them and corner them before they crossed the Potomac into Virginia. And so according to his aides, he was haunting the War Department telegraph office day and night to try to direct the armies to make you know, an aggressive move against Lee's uh, troops. Well, when the Civil War books and the biographies of Lincoln focus on that, they sometimes overlook the personal trauma that was going on back at the cottage. Because if it's true that Mary Lincoln was on her deathbed, then her husband wasn't with her. Now, you know, I don't have a lot of testimony for this. So I admit some of this is speculation. But here's what I find very fascinating. Uh, as soon as Mary Lincoln was recovered, maybe even only halfway recovered, but two weeks after this uh, great accident, after her wound, so after her infection sort of heals, toward the end of July, she uh, makes a decision to leave Washington and actually goes on her longest journey of the entire war for 10 weeks. She's gone for 10 straight weeks. Now, I, you know, I'm reading a lot into this, but I think she is utterly devastated that at a moment when she was either sick or perhaps really dying, her husband is neglecting her. And it's clear that once and for all, she is not the first priority in his life. Uh, and therefore, she's away. Now, this is where, again, it becomes kind of interesting, because six or eight weeks into her journey, 
Abraham Lincoln starts to write her affectionate letters again. And, you know, just like we have this letter from April 1848, this collection of letters that we have from the fall of 1863, they're one of the only other letters we have between husband and wife. And they're, they're kind of ordinary mundane letters. They comment on the weather, on Tad's pets, on gossip, you know, from the neighbors. But they are kind of ordinarily affectionate and gently encouraging her to return. Abraham Lincoln tells her, the weather is cooler, the rumors of disease have passed. When are you coming home? Looking forward to your return. Please let me know. I haven't heard. When are you coming back? We have three letters like this. And so it makes me think that this is a, not just a turning point in the war, but a turning point in their marriage. As he realizes once again, as he did in 1848, that maybe she wasn't his first priority, but she was an important priority, and he needed both life and work in balance. And that's why I have this quotation here from Walt Whitman. Uh, this extraordinary snapshot. Whitman was, uh, had a minor job in the Treasury Department and served as a volunteer nurse during the war in Washington. Of course, the great poet. He was also a newspaper correspondent for the Brooklyn Eagle and the New York Times, and he kept a diary. And he lived uh, on the route that Lincoln took between the soldiers' home and the White House, and he saw him every day. Walt Whitman, our greatest poet, Abraham Lincoln, our greatest president, they see each other every day. And this is what Whitman writes about it. I see the president almost every day, as I happen to live where he passes to and from his lodgings out of town. He never sleeps at the White House during the hot season, but has quarters at a healthy location some three miles north of the city, the soldier's home, a United States military establishment. I saw him this morning about 8.30 coming into business, riding on Vermont Avenue near L Street. And then, you know, what Whitman does next is kind of what we would expect from him, and I think what we are sometimes guilty of doing, which is you try to read this great mystery into Lincoln's face. I see very plainly Abraham Lincoln's dark brown face with the deep cut lines, the eyes always to me with a deep latent sadness in the expression we have got so that we exchange bows and very cordial ones. They passed me once very close, and I saw the president in the face fully as they were moving slowly. And his look, though abstracted, happened to be directed steadily in my eye. He bowed and smiled, but far beneath his smile, I noticed well the expression I have alluded to. None of the artists or pictures has caught the deep, though subtle and indirect expression of this man's face. There is something else there. One of the great portrait painters of two or three centuries ago is needed. Now, coming from Whitman, I think this is wise and profound, but I, I also think there is something that all of us project into Lincoln, something deep and profound, and perhaps unnecessary in the sense that what he is looking at in this moment, in August of 63, is a president who's focused and working hard and being mechanical about his daily commute and trying to get the job done. He's living alone at the cottage and going into work at the White House with Congress out of session. And he happens to be kind of serene because he doesn't have any distractions and he can focus. And what is he thinking about at this moment? Summer of 1863? He's thinking about how the war has changed and how to explain that to the American people. And in a series of public letters that culminate in the great Gettysburg Address, he gives voice to that expression. And we find in his ex explanation about the new birth of freedom a way to describe what's a wholesale revolution in what the war was about and how it would be fought. And there is something there that happens uh, between the soldier's home, the White House, and what he will say at Gettysburg that requires this reflection, this reflection, this peace of mind. Uh, one way to embody this very quickly is to point out that on July 4th, 1863, Lincoln had to give a speech off the cuff about the meaning of Independence Day in the middle of this war. And he began, or he didn't quite begin, but in the early part of the speech, he said, how long ago was it, 80 odd years, that our nation was founded? Well, from July, when he was a little uncertain about the dating, how long ago was it, to November 19th, 1863 at Gettysburg, when he had biblical certainty, four scored seven years ago, our fathers brought forth, you see a man who is thinking hard about the war, his responsibilities as a leader, and about what it all means. And I do see, also in their marriage, after this point of time, a kind of equilibrium. Uh, Mary Lincoln, in the election of 1864, is back at her husband's side, helping him in the re-election campaign. This is also not well known, but she writes letters on his behalf to key supporters. She cultivates potential rivals to try to help him. There's one letter I love from her. Some of you may know this. Mary Lincoln was a little um, 
unethical with someone for bookkeeping practices. Uh, it wasn't uncommon in Washington to, to fix the books a bit in order to pad your budgets, but Lincoln would never do this. She did. Um, and in one of her letters to someone else who shared her sense of ethics and who was therefore upset with her husband because he had denied this man who was an important political figure certain plums he thought were his, she writes about her own husband. Poor Mr. L is practically monomaniacal on the subject of honesty. And you can almost see her. You can almost see her thinking to herself, I'm doing him a lot of good by sending this message to the man. Uh, but they are together in the summer of 64. They are working hard for his reelection. He is being bold. They are one unit. And I find in this story a kind of change, you know, where she is now integrated into his political life and he is more respectful of, of his role in their private life. And I think that turning point in the war, the summer of 63, is a turning point in their marriage. And I find that story one that you can only really tell with this setting in mind at the soldier's home. And that's why when I look at this last quote from Mary Lincoln after his death, I see extra meaning in it. She says, how dearly I love the soldier's home and how little I supposed one year since that we would be so far removed from it. This is the place where they finally found that balance, that satisfaction that had been eluding them. And because they found that place and that space together, it made him a better leader. And you know, so when I look back on this whole story and I think about its meaning, I find inspiration both in Lincoln's failures and his successes. You know, all of us struggle to balance work and family, uh, the demands of the office with the demands of the home. And uh, we shouldn't be so hard on ourselves. If Abraham Lincoln couldn't do it well for much of his life, we should not fret that we struggle with it. But the fact that he found the success in the way he did, if it's true, the way I'm describing it, if that is part of his growth as a leader, then it's a, just a reminder to us that places matter, that you need to find time. In fact, maybe the greatest asset of all that we have is time. Time with ourselves, time with our families, time to reflect. And you have to carve that out. Even Lincoln had to carve that out of his day. In the middle of the Civil War, with tasks and responsibilities greater than any of us face, he still found time to have a summer retreat and time uh, spent at leisure with his family. And it's just a reminder to all of us who are, you know, guilty of carrying uh, you know, gadgets with us so that we can text and email and stay connected all the time that sometimes you have to disconnect. And Lincoln knew that and we should try to emulate that in this bicentennial year. So um, you've already proven this because you've taken time out of your day to come here and reflect and think about something as important as Abraham Lincoln on a night like this and so you should feel proud of yourselves for that. Uh, but I wanted to end with that note and, you know, thank you for coming and then ask you if anyone has any questions or comments about, you know, what we've discussed today and, and what it means. And feel free if you want to bring up any subject related to Lincoln, not just what I've talked about here. Yes? Uh, my recollection was that when Lincoln commuted to the soldier's home, uh, some, one night somebody shot his hat. Right. And if he had any kind of security going back and forth, I mean, uh, there were a lot of people who wanted to kill him all the time. Right. So this is an important question. Did someone shoot Lincoln's hat off when he was riding to the soldier's home? And, and what kind of security did he have? Let me answer the second part first. You know, no president had ever been assassinated before. There had been a, a knife-wielding assailant who had once sort of threatened Andrew Jackson. Uh, he had beaten him back by hand. It was a classic Andrew Jackson story. Um, <laughs> But otherwise, and there was once a threat against Franklin Pierce, of all people, and he had a bodyguard briefly, but otherwise there was no real experience with this. At the beginning of the war, Lincoln had no security detail. When he went out to the soldier's home, he had no security detail the first summer of 1862. But when uh, Lee's army invaded Maryland uh, in the battle that culminated at Antietam, they decided at the War Department to dispatch a cavalry unit to escort him back and forth between the soldier's home and the White House, and an infantry company to stay with him when he was at the cottage or when he was at the White House. The infantry company was from Pennsylvania, and the cavalry unit at first was from New York and then later from Ohio. Um, but they didn't have any uh, military bodyguards. Uh, at the end of the war, because there were so many threats against his life, they assigned uh, police detectives uh, to Abraham Lincoln. But even then, they weren't like Secret Service today. They followed him from building to building, deposited him wherever he was going, and then would go to a bar and drink. That's where they were the night he was shot at Ford's Theater. You know, they, did, they did not have any expectation of staying with him all the time. Um, 
Now, as far as the other question is concerned, uh, which is about the story about him getting his hat shot off, it's a great story told by a real person, a man named John Nichols, who was part of the infantry company from Pennsylvania that was assigned to the soldier's home. He gave an interview with a Wheeling, West Virginia newspaper after the Civil War, where he said, I was on duty one night, we heard a gunshot, and then a few minutes later, Abraham Lincoln came riding up hatless. Uh, he did sometimes ride without his cavalry escort. He would dismiss them. And this is one of those nights, according to Nichols, in the summer of 1864. And um, he said, later, we went down the pathways and we found Lincoln's hat in the underbrush with a bullet hole through the brim. Now, this story, if you ask me, even though it's from a real person who was there and it's plausible, it strikes me as too amazing to be believable. Because according to Nichols, he took the hat to Lincoln the next day with the bullet hole in it. And Lincoln said, let's just keep this between us. <laughs> It'll worry my wife. And that was the end of the story. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I, don't, I put it in my book because I wanted people to see the details. I don't really believe it. I think Nichols was exaggerating. But I don't know for sure. It's one of those sort of uh, unanswered questions. It's possible, but it's also something I'm skeptical over. Yes? Very tight. Right. Robert Henderson did it. And uh, what is generally thought of the diagnosis there? I've never read. Right. Was she really mentally ill? Right. So the question is about uh, Mary's um, mental illness. She was committed briefly uh, about 10 years after Lincoln's death in the middle of the 1870s. Uh, and her son was the one who had her committed. They had to have a trial in order to do it. It was against her will, so there was a hearing. So we have all kinds of court records. So this is a complicated story. Scholars disagree. You bring 10 Lincoln scholars in this room, they'll divide five and five on this question. So I'm right, but you'll just take it for what it's worth. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think she was crazy, but I do think uh, 10 years after Lincoln's death, she had a kind of breakdown. Uh, almost everyone acknowledges that. Uh, what people argue over is whether she had some sort of mental illness prior to his death, whether she was bipolar or depressed or you know, had some other condition. Uh, I just, I don't see any of that in him or her. But after all the deaths she went through, she lost three of her four sons and him. 10 years afterwards, she seemed to have some kind of breakdown. And her son had, uh, he had sympathy for her, but he didn't know how to handle it. And he was worried for her health, for her estate. And she also may have been over-medicated. It's not quite clear. Um, the medications they prescribed for people then were sometimes worse than the symptoms they were treating. Uh, she was clearly disoriented. And then there was a problem with um, her family. She had sisters, but they couldn't take her in at the time because they were sick. So Robert felt like he had no alternative but to have her committed to an asylum, and she wouldn't go voluntarily. So they had a hearing. It was ugly. It made all kinds of national news. She spent about six months in this asylum in Illinois and then was released into the custody of her sister. She was soon certified sane. Uh, you know, in modern terms, I don't think anybody would have diagnosed her as crazy. Uh, but in their terms, they saw her behavior as eccentric and crazy. And they had very little sympathy for women who were, you know, experiencing, you know, grief in the way she was or, uh, you know, even things as uh, simple as uh, obsessive shopping. You know, which we would consider, you know, par for the course. But they might consider um, deranged. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but that's the best answer I can give you. I don't think of her as crazy, although I do think she probably had a breakdown on the 10th anniversary of his death. Uh, she was committed, and then very shortly after that, released. Yes. I Well, she was from Kentucky. That part is true. But she was, uh, uh, according to Lincoln's bodyguard, you know, one of the soldiers who guarded them, she was the worst rebel hater he had ever seen. Uh, she had family that was in the Confederate Army. And she was perhaps sympathetic in that sense. But uh, she was an ardent and very loyal defender of her husband. And so she saw the Confederates as people who were trying to kill, destroy, ruin her husband. And therefore, I don't think there's any doubt that she was a rebel hater in that sense. She thought that the, the Confederacy was treason. Um, 
there were lots of rumors and gossip that she was disloyal during the Civil War, but you know, I think all of that is fantasy. That connection. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, her brother was in the Confederate Army actually visited the White House during the war. Yeah. Well, so, uh, is that correct? Now, he didn't visit the White House, but he was in the Confederate Army, and then uh, relatives visited the White House. Women, not men. His wife? Yeah. Yeah, the widow. Yeah, her half sister. And she got a lot of criticism for that. But Abraham Lincoln was the one who authorized it because, you know, he thought it would help her. Yes. I'm curious to hear your opinion as a Lincoln scholar. Um, I guess the, the historiography of Lincoln himself, I mean, it seems to be divided into kind of really celebratory books on one end and Thomas Delanzo on the other end. Kind of, uh, not Lincoln for a variety of things that have been true or not faced by others. Right. I'm just kind of curious where, you know, why do you think there's such a divide and where do you think the book is going? So these are good questions. Uh, they're big questions, though. I mean, you can see perhaps where I am trying to be on a question like this. I'm inspired by Lincoln when I see him as human. You know? And so the books that treat him as a kind of marble saint, I don't find very believable. Because I know that he had a temper, and he was flawed, and he made mistakes. And yet, that's what I find so inspiring, is that because he uh, was so human, it's remarkable that he achieved so much. Uh, now, there is always this certain enduring strain of Lincoln haters. And you mentioned uh, this libertarian scholar, Thomas D. Lorenzo, who thinks Lincoln was the great centralizer, who started us off on this socialist revolution. I don't, I don't put much stock in that. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, that's an enduring strain. There are real arguments to be made. We can have a debate about this. Uh, but they always represent a minority view. I mean, uh, almost everybody has a positive view of Lincoln. There are always exceptions. And the views shift. You know, it used to be that the black community was the strongest of Lincoln's supporters. And in the post-civil rights era, the black community seems divided on Lincoln and his legacy because even though he was a great emancipator, perhaps he wasn't uh, an egalitarian in every sense of the modern word uh, or in our view of civil rights. I, I have my own views on that, but that's the perception in their community some, in some cases. Uh, I get, you know, the two questions I get most frequently when I talk are, was Lincoln a racist and was he gay? And these are sort of modern day concerns that people apply uh, to the past. But uh, where I think the field is going is a little different than those two poles. You know, uh, where I think the field is going, and this is something that I've been talking about with staff from the library here today, is um, I think the field is going toward a more realistic view of Lincoln based on new evidence. As crazy as this might sound to you, uh, we're getting new evidence about Lincoln every day partly because of the digital revolution. Uh, they are finding new letters, not just from Lincoln, but about Lincoln from people who might have been you know, soldiers in the bodyguard that uh, were assigned to him at the cottage. When I was assigned to write a pamphlet for the National Trust about the Lincoln Cottage, uh, I got an email from a reenacting group in Meadville, Pennsylvania, an email. Uh, about, this is about seven years ago now eight years ago, and they said, you know, we uh, reenact the company that guarded Lincoln, and there's a soldier in that unit who wrote letters home to his wife, and we, we have them. It turned out that, uh, not to his wife, sorry, to his mother. Uh, this soldier had a mother who had lost her husband before the war. His name was Willard Cutter. He wrote her once a week for three years. There was 150 letters. He was with Lincoln every day for three years. And nobody had ever seen the letters or used them. They were in the basement of an auto dealership in Meadville, Pennsylvania. The only people who knew about them were reenactors. And the only reason I knew about them really was because of email. You know, because it's so easy for people to contact each other. They contacted me and the trust, told us about this. I went up to Meadville, saw these letters, and they form a nice part of, of my story. I've been finding letters online through keyword searches. One of the questions in my book that I had to try to answer was where Lincoln wrote the Emancipation Proclamation. I wasn't really able to answer it in my book, but I kept working on it after the book was published. And there was a letter that one of Lincoln's aides wrote to a 16-year-old girl he was trying to impress. He was courting her. He was only 23, just so you don't get the wrong idea. So he's 23, she's 16. He's writing a letter from the White House Library on the day that Lincoln is actually drafting emancipation. 
And this letter has never appeared in any book about Lincoln or emancipation, but it got digitized a few years ago by the Gilder Lehrman Institute for American History that, that I think Rod mentioned earlier. And uh, I was able to find it. Uh, because when you're writing a book about emancipation, you wouldn't look in the Jay family papers in New York and look at Mary Jay's letters. She was just a 16-year-old girl at the time. But in that letter, John Hay essentially tells her emancipation's being written right now because he's trying to impress her that he was there. And you know, this is how history is going to change in the next generation. We're heading into the sesquicentennial of the Civil War, the 150th anniversary. And there are little letters and diaries and documents scattered all over this country that have never seen the light of day. And people during the anniversary are going to contribute these letters to digital projects, like the one here at Drake, or like one I'm doing at Dickinson or others. And as that material gets put online and we're able to search it, we'll, we'll be able to fill in many of the gaps about Lincoln and the war that are right now missing. And that's gonna give us a finer grained picture. So what I tell people is, we're about to move from analog to high def when it comes to history of the 19th century. Yes? Uh, so this is one of the great questions. Yeah, no, no, no. This is one of the, the great questions. Uh, how committed was Lincoln to slavery, uh, to the abolition of slavery? You know scholars disagree. Uh, but um, here, here, here's the way I, I would put it. Lincoln was always opposed to slavery. Um, but he was concerned that uh, it should be abolished voluntarily and with compensation for the slave masters, not for the slaves. When the war broke out, he had another problem, which is that there were 15 slave states at the outset of the Civil War, but four of them, after Sumter, were still in the Union. And to lose those four slave states would be the same thing as to lose the war, because one of them was Maryland. And you know, to lose the nation's capital at the outset of the war would have been devastating. So he had to, to downplay slavery as a cause of the war, try to keep those slave states loyal to the Union, but after a year of fighting, it became clear that you know, um, they were secure, but the slaves represented the next great front. And so he had to figure out a way to try to use emancipation as a weapon against the South. Uh, so he took his natural anti-slavery beliefs and the pressure of military and political necessity, because he's getting pushed by the Congress to do this, and uh, inaugurates this emancipation policy. And I'll tell you how I know he really believed it was because it's not just you know that moment on January 1st, 1863, when he writes the proclamation. That's actually, in a way, I know this sounds a little flippant, that's small potatoes. Because the big moment comes in the summer of 1864 when he's running for re-election on the platform, not of just emancipating slaves in the southern states, but he actually goes before the people as a candidate for re-election for president on the platform of the 13th Amendment. He promises that if he is reelected, he will abolish slavery everywhere, immediately, without compensation for anyone. And in August of 64, everybody thought he was going to lose re-election. And so they, some of them, some of his closest allies, begged him to abandon emancipation. They said, it's killing you in the North. You know, white people don't want to fight for black freedom. And that's why you're going to lose. And he said to them, I would be damned in time and in eternity if I abandoned the promise of emancipation. So when it counted most, when he had to risk the most personally, he didn't flinch. And he stood by the policy. That's how I know he was sincere about it. Yeah. Yes. All right. Now this is a... This is an important question, because I agree with it in some sense, but I take a different uh, meaning from it. Uh, there was a period uh, after Lincoln got elected when uh, they, they rolled out the old machine for compromise, like they had always done in the past with these sectional issues. Uh, a senator named John Crittenden proposed a, a measure that would have settled the issue between North and South. Uh, they called it the Crittenden Compromise. It was kind of reminiscent of the Compromise of 1850, or the Missouri Compromise, except it went even further. And uh, Republican leaders on Capitol Hill contacted President-elect Lincoln. He's, no, he's not president yet. Uh, he's, you know, 
just the president-elect, but they asked him, what should we do about this compromise proposal? And he wrote them twice, two letters that said the same thing. It's a very memorable line. And I think it's the most decisive point in the coming of the Civil War. He writes to them, the tug has to come, and better now than any time hereafter. Now, if you ask me, until that moment, the war is still avoidable that if Lincoln wanted to compromise, they would have found a way to compromise, and they would have pushed back the conflict further. Now, the way you asked the question, it almost, it almost made it seem as if that was a mistake to push the war forward, but I actually think this is one of his great moments, when he forces a conflict that had been delayed and delayed and delayed in order to you know, change the nature of the Union from one that was a compact built around slavery to one that would be a nation moving forward without it. So I find this firmness to be bold and important and good, but somebody might look at the same decision and see it to be a, a huge blunder that helped bring about a war that killed hundreds of thousands of people. Yes? That's one way to put it, yeah. The, the South was left, I mean, the South was left just terribly destitute. Right. I mean, those were not yeah. bad people down there. Sure. You don't, you don't blame them for the war at all? They, oh, no, I blame them, too. Yeah. They were probably willing to compromise. Yeah. They were probably willing to compromise because they'd been compromising for years. But so I think that, you talk about the Lincoln must have had a sad face, all right? If he had lived much longer, Yeah, well, look, I know I shouldn't channel Lincoln, right? You know, uh, nobody speaks for him. But uh, I, I guarantee you, he knew the cost of the war. Uh, those 620,000 dead had died by the time he gave his second inaugural address. And he said at that point, if the war has to go on for 200 more years, it will go on for 200 more years to eradicate the sin of slavery. Um, it was one of the most powerful statements a uh, president could ever make. It, it is the, the apology for slavery that everyone talks about. He said slavery was a sin and we're paying for it with lives. 620,000 men in our terms, just so you can s see the scope of this, that's 6 million plus. You know, you multiply numbers by 10. 6 million plus in our terms. It's, it's a holocaust. And yet uh, he thought it was worthwhile. And he never wavered. And that's the thing about Lincoln. It's not just that he said in the winter of 60, that the tug has to come, but there were times, dozens of times, between 1861 and 1865 when people came to him and said, let's negotiate an end to this, let's get out of it, and he refused. So I don't think he wavered at all. Now, do we want to do one more question? One, is it, if anyone has one more question, uh, well, uh, how about you? It's a wider question. Uh, they talked about when he would go to this uh, hall, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, there, there are a lot of stories about what he liked to eat or didn't eat. Um, he was six foot four inches tall and he weighed 185 pounds. So whatever he ate, it wasn't a lot of it. Um, uh, I, the, the stories about what he ate are kind of unreliable. Um, but, uh, you know, the, generally speaking, I think he had a light breakfast. Uh, he would sometimes... Uh, you know, have a heavier midday meal, but he would often get by with apples. And according to his law partner, 16 cups of coffee a day. Uh, <laughs> which makes sense to me when I think about him as an alcohol uh, alcoholic, a workaholic who was highly caffeinated. Uh, but in any event, um, uh, I think uh, he wasn't someone who spent a lot of time focusing on his meals. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for having me.